This is Dream Power Radio, the place where your dreams turn into reality. Here is your host, Debbie Specter Weissman. Hello, 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 and welcome to Dream Power Radio. This is a show where we talk about dreams, both daytime and nighttime dreams, and how you can use them to make the internal shift to a life you love and rediscover the truth of who you really are. I've said this plenty of times on this show, and I never get tired of saying it. Dreams can change your life. I've told the story many times of the dream that changed my life. I'm not going to bore you with that now, but many people can attest to this. In fact, an organization I belong to called the International Association for the Study of Dreams even published a book a few years ago called Dreams That Change Our Lives filled with over a 100 accounts of dreams that had a profound effect on the people who had them. Well, I have a treat for you today. We're going to be speaking with a man whose dreams took him from a life of depression and despair to one filled with joy and unconditional love. His name is John David Lotta, and he wrote a book about what dreams have meant to him called The Synchronicity of Love, Stories that Heal, Transform, and Awaken. And we're going to talk about it now. Welcome to Dream Power Radio, John. Thank you so much, Debbie. I'm super happy to be here. Well, it is my pleasure because I do love to talk about dreams. But John, let me ask you this. Like me, you're someone who didn't really consider yourself a dreamer growing up. So when was it that you realized that you could see the power behind dreams? Well, I went to my first ever spiritual retreat about 20 years ago, and the gentleman that led the retreat, Dr. William Brew Joy, he went by his middle name Brew, spent a lot of time on dreams, and he gave all of us, including myself, a process for trying to stimulate and remember dreams, and that was <clears throat> go to bed at night, have a journal or a pen or a recording device next to the side of the bed, and as you're starting to fall asleep, imagine yourself standing on the edge of a huge cliff. You take off all your clothes, you're completely naked, turn your back to the abyss and fall back into the abyss in total trust and ask for a dream. And I did it night after night. And pretty soon I had a dream, a snippet, then a whole dream and then another dream. And then sometimes five dreams a night. (laughs) If anything, I had to learn how to kind of modulate the flow. (laughs) And very early on, I didn't really understand the language of dreams, but pretty soon, maybe about a year The dreams started to make sense, and there was a wide variety of dreams, and I realized I got so much out of my dreams. And I wrote a chapter in my book. I was scribbling it down just a little bit before our call here, and the chapter is called The Spectrum of Dreams. And I wrote down, I think, 15 different kinds of dreams, and they're so multifaceted. They're so rich. They're so beautiful. They're so helpful. It's hard to really know where to begin, but it added a whole richness to my life that I had never known prior to that. So what was the first dream that was meaningful for you? I can tell you exactly. So my journey really began like so many people that go through deep transformation with pain and suffering. (laughs) And so my relatively charmed life had fallen apart just practically overnight. I lost all of our money deeply in debt. I got divorced. They had custody of my two kids and had this terrifying fear of death stalking me, which I don't know where that came from and not didn't know what to do with it. So I'd gone to that first spiritual retreat. The same time I had joined group therapy, something I'd never done before. And I quickly became aware I was essentially the only guy in a group of about 10 women and two women therapists. And I felt unbelievably vulnerable in that setting. And one of the first dreams I had was all the women in the group, this was the dream, were gathered together and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to be peeling shrimp, but I'm really worried about John. And I overheard it and I said, well, why is peeling shrimp a problem? I love shrimp. And they said, well, peeling shrimp can be very painful and very messy. And it took me a while to understand the analogy of peeling the shell off the shrimp. It was exactly the process as I was about to go through. And I was very happy peeling the shells off of other people. I did not want the shells peeled off of me. So that was my first warning of you are about to enter something that is entirely new and vulnerable for me. Mm. Well, we're going to get into a lot more of that, but I just want to get back a second to the the mechanics of it. So when you first started your dreams, how easy was it for you to actually remember the dreams, to be able to have something to write down? It started slowly, but I think it became, you know, I, I remember my first dream. It was like 
three seconds long. I, and I couldn't make sense of it. It was so short. I was on a raft going through on a raging river in the Amazon. The end. Done. I didn't know what to make of it. But that was the beginning. And then a little bit more, a little bit more. And I, I'd have to go back and look. But I'm going to say it didn't take more than maybe a month before I was remembering my dreams pretty much in their entirety. I mean, you know, you know how you probably know this. I mean, sometimes they're hard to hang on to. I don't know why that is. Sometimes they're really easy to hang on to. And but I would say about a month before I started remembering pretty much an entire dream and writing them down. And then once you have it written down, do you analyze them? In the beginning, I had no idea. I had a bunch of cool images and symbols and it was craziness. And my very logical mind couldn't make any sense of it. It was like learning Chinese. And in a way, that is an apt analogy because if you learn Chinese, it's a language of symbols. And dreams are the same way. And so I did have a lot of help in the beginning. Brew had created a dream form and he and some incredible incredibly wonderful people at dream interpretation were on there. And so I think probably like a lot of people, I started with help from others. I started playing with dream dictionaries, even though I was being counseled all along that ultimately these are your dreams and you need to figure them out. And so to be honest, it was a, it, you know, especially for somebody that identified as highly rational and logical, it was a difficult process because I learned over time that um, for me anyway, dreams inquire an intuitive touch. And I had to kind of develop that intuition over time before I could really understand the language of my dreams. Okay. So you said that uh, Brew had actually had developed or got you into working with a, a dream forum. What was it like for you to share your dreams with other people? Well, the first few dreams I posted, when people replied what they meant, I'm like, how the hell did you get that interpretation? Like, you know, I just, and it really funny, looking back, I was in a process at the very beginning of, you might say, claiming or reclaiming an entirely what some people call feminine side to myself. And the dreams were revealing that. And it's like, you know, but I didn't understand that, but they sure understood it. And so... Did you even know you had a feminine side? <laughs> no. And I, I actually was frightened of it too. And luckily, again, some I got really lucky on some really wise people. Brew in particular kept saying, you know, don't be afraid of it. Allow it in. It's not like one eclipses the other, you know, they'll be in balance with each other. And ultimately, if you allow in this entire realm of what some people might call feminine, you'll be more resourceful than ever before. And so that gave me a lot of peace. It wasn't like I was trading one for the other. Oh, I'm going to give up my masculine. Now I'm going to be feminine. Although it did kind of feel that way for a while. And once I got comfortable with it, I actually really started to embrace it. Something that we talk a lot about on this show is the power of healing dreams. And I understand that you had experience with this as well. So can you tell me about the dreams that actually helped you heal, especially the ones that help you deal with pain? So I have a number of healing dreams, and I had two in particular. I had chronic neck pain for six years that I attributed to being rear-ended in a car accident. And I was very athletic and active. And over time, boy, that chronic neck pain was just bogging me down. And I came home from work. And by, by the way, I tried everything. I tried massage and physical therapy and acupuncture and chiropractic, even had surgery where they injected uh, cortisone in the facet joints in my neck. And nothing, nothing worked. I tried exercises. I tried standing up my desk and nothing would work for more than a day or two. And one day I came home from work early and I laid down on the bed and I was literally in tears. It hurt so bad. And I remembered saying, why the fuck does my neck hurt so bad? And instantly I'm in a dream. And the dream is a monk with shaved head and a red, red robe pacing back and forth outside my house. End of dream. Again, this is in the early days, only maybe a year after I began sort of my dream exploration. And so I went on the dream form and said, this dream seemed to be answering my question, but I don't get it. How in the world does this have anything to do? And I remember Brew jumping in and saying, that dream has everything to do with why your neck hurts. I'm like, I don't get it. How is this dream of a monk outside my house have anything to do with my neck pain? And he said, I want you to explore the idea that you have a very spiritual side, even a selfless monk side which prior to that, I had been in complete resistance, 30 years of antagonistic towards anything remotely relating to spirituality or religion, and, and tried to imagine, you know, metaphorically letting that monk into your house, so to speak, seeing him as a part of you. 
And I was like, okay. So I tried and I tried and a few months go by. And now I have another dream. And now Brew himself is coming towards me and he's going to heal my neck pain with his hands. And in the dream, I'm like, oh my God, thank God, finally. And as he reaches for my neck, an angry old man who lives in my neck says, get the fuck away. End of dream. And so now I'm on to it. And Brew helped me see, I'm just one of those people that when I'm highly resistant, carries a lot of resistance in my neck. And I didn't realize the degree to which, and because I'm going through this whole spiritual transformation and entering all things feminine, which for a lot of highly masculine men is terrifying, I have resistance galore in my neck. And two years after the first dream, I had the final culminating dream where I had this golden thumbtack. I'm, this is in the dream, and I'm sitting in my office, and I go to stick it, a large thumbtack, into the bulletin board behind me, but it feels odd, and I turn around, and standing behind me is this beautiful Asian monk, red robes, shaved head, and I've plunged the tack right into his heart, and he's smiling at me with such love, and I suddenly realized my neck didn't hurt anymore, and it never did. It was gone. And so to this day, it's still something I have to kind of keep an eye on. Like I'm, I have more conscious awareness of starting to carry resistance and learning to just relax and let it go. So all my chronic neck pain ended. So I don't, I don't go to massage or therapy or chiropractic or sit on bouncy balls at my desk anymore. And then one other brief one, true story. I had to fly a lot in my old career as CEO of a large company. I had to fly probably 25 times a year. And I had to fly on this particular trip from Seattle to Jacksonville, Florida with a connection to Dallas, 30 minute meeting, and then fly all the way back the next day. The day before my trip, I threw my back out. Like, I'm grumbling. I'm mad. I know how this is going to play out. I know how I'm going to suffer sitting on uncomfortable airplane seats for hours and hours. Like, I'm wondering if I'm even going to be able to walk by the end of the trip. And the next morning, I wake up. You know, it's like four in the morning, and my back still hurts. And I drive to the airport. I can barely get out of my car. I have to literally grab my roof of my car and hoist myself and lift my legs out. And as I'm standing in line of security grumbling and just stealing myself for what's going to be a horrible trip. Suddenly there's some aspect of me that is singing and humming the song, don't worry, be happy. And I knew kind of loosely that sound and vibration could be healing. And I suddenly went, you know, all this grumbling isn't going to be helpful. And so I started humming the song and it became like this happy mantra. And the nice thing about airplanes and airports, it's noisy, so nobody can hear you humming the song. And I hummed that chorus thousands of times. It was crazy. It felt like a test from the universe. Every single time I sat in the window seat and the person in the middle seat was impossibly large. Make a long story short, by the end of the trip, my back pain was gone. And so I'm not sure, this is what I'm going to say, dreams are so multifaceted. But by opening to dreams, I also opened myself to whatever it is that comes in and says, why don't you sing a happy song instead of grumbling about how you know it's going to be? And so one of the ways dreams has been healing to me is to teach me that I have some bad habits and it's okay to break out of those bad habits. Well, that's the thing about dreams is that it does give you that awareness that you wouldn't have any other way. And I want to go back to your, your initial dream about the monks, because monks actually do play a very important part in dreams. In history of dreaming, they show up many, many, many times. And in modern times, there's a woman named Kathleen uh, O'Keefe Cannabis who had a very powerful dream, set of dreams about monks who came to her and helped her discover and then ultimately get treatment for breast cancer. And if she had never paid attention to that dream or that series of dreams, she might even be with here here with us today. And that's, again, the testament to the power of dreams. On that note, we are going to take a short break. Uh, speaking with John David Latta about dreams, and we'll be right back. If you're not pleased with the trajectory of your life, the time to begin your own personal transformation is now and your dreams can help pave the way. How? By tapping into your unvoiced confidence. What is unvoiced confidence, you say? It's acceptance of your abilities and qualities. It's a state of mind coming from liking and even loving yourself, and feeling free to say or do anything you want without concern for the judgment of others. You were born confident, may have had it chipped away little by little by the negative self-beliefs you've picked up over the years. 
If you're looking for the heightened energy, clarity of thought, and the feeling of being more alive that comes from self-confidence, you can rediscover it by paying attention to your dreams. Need some help doing this? Go to my website, thedreamcoach.net, and sign up for my complimentary dream discovery session. I can help show you how your dreams can help you return to the confident person you were always meant to be. Again, go to thedreamcoach.net, thedreamcoach.net. Welcome back to Dream Power Radio with your host, Debbie Specter weissman Yes, welcome back to Dream Power Radio. I'm your host, Debbie Specter weissman and we're talking about dreams with John David Lada. Well, John, you write in your book about dreams that you had in the daytime, and, and I'm curious about whether those dreams had were different from the ones you experience at night? That's a great question. I've never thought about that, Debbie. The dreams I have at night, probably like a lot of people, are primarily what I would call of a psychological nature. It can be just the body and the mind releasing stress, trying to integrate or understand something. But the dreams by day seem to be more intentional. And they're always shocking when they happen, because I'm actually not a person that that happens to me every single day. But when they do, they're beautiful and extraordinary. And they always seem to be of a, what I would call teaching nature. I think there's a chapter in my book where I took my daughter and her little friends out to dinner. and We were at a Chinese restaurant and it was moderately crowded and the girls are chattering away and all the patrons there are chattering away. And I'm watching this one Asian waitress and I, my male judge was in full force. I didn't think she was very attractive. She was kind of tall and sloped shoulder, shoulder and kind of buck tooth. And I'm watching her. And she disappears behind some swinging doors into the kitchen. And when she walks back out, it's like all of time stands still. And she's the most beautiful creature on earth. And again, this is not something that I, that happens to me every day. I mean, she was like beauty incarnate. I don't really even know how to put it into words. And it was like those old fashioned romantic movies where the frame around the scene is all fuzzy and diffuse. I mean, it was so beautiful. And it lasted maybe five or 10 seconds and it's over. She's back to her regular person and the girls are chattering. Nobody saw it but me. And so the lesson in that was, no, there is physical beauty, but behind the physical beauty, there's always something else. And so I've tried to not let my male judge get in the way of how I see people sometimes. And so that was my take on that whole experience, that behind the human being, behind the facade, behind the body is a soul. And that soul is beautiful. Mm, That is a beautiful thought to to have. You write so many dreams in this book. And one of the ones I found kind of really interesting to me was the one where it involved both Jesus and Hercules. Yes. Talk about that and tell me uh, how that impacted you. Yeah, that was, um, so if you remember, part of the pain and suffering I was experiencing in the beginning of the journey was this abject fear of death that came out of nowhere. And I didn't know who to talk to about it because I didn't consider myself religious or spiritual. So I secretly buried it away. Well, I had joined a year-round study group and the teacher said, for the month of November, we're going to explore the mystery of death. And I thought, oh, my God, here's my time to finally confront the very thing that's been terrifying me. And he goes, I want you to meditate on death, pray on death, prepare for your death, make a will if you need to, make amends to others if you have to, listen to music on death, read books on death. And so one of the things I did was I went and asked for a dream about death. And And it doesn't always happen, but if I make a sincere request for a dream, it usually comes through, I would say 90% of the time. And this was very sincere. And literally the first dream that came through that said, before you know about death, first you need to know about life. And this dream was, I was taken to this room in this house and I saw Jesus standing sort of tall and resolute, but wedded to him from the waist down was Hercules. And Hercules was struggling and struggling to get away from Jesus. But they were Siamese twins. They were connected from the weight scan. And there was a point at which Hercules looked over his shoulder and saw Jesus. And you might say, realized they were brothers. And there was this huge hug. And that was the end of the dream. And so I think that was my first glimpse into seeing that we are both human and divine. And Hercules might be 
a representation of the personality of the ego, and Jesus might be a representation of our divinity. And they're linked together, and they work together, ideally, not always. And I even think seeing Hercules struggling to go his own way, you, know, like you could see all of his sweat and muscle and sinew, was probably a, a good description of the ego always wanting to go its own way, but it's connected to something deeper, and that something deeper is what's really behind everything. And how did this help you deal with death? Well, because the next night I went back in and said, okay, now what? And it's like, okay, now we're going to teach you about non-physical death. And so this dream's a little bizarre, but weirdly, it almost feels like it's been playing out in my life. In the dream, it feels like October. It's a cold night. I'm walking through a farmer's field where it looks like he's already harvested all the crops and the field's sort of put to bed for winter. But in front of me is this huge, imposing, terrifying looking scarecrow. He's 10 feet tall and he's almost daring me to go past him. And there's a low like harvest moon on the horizon, but I do. And as soon as I go past him, the moon comes towards me and we fuse. We become one and we turn into a river of liquid mercury running across the top of the earth. I can see it shimmering in the moon, you know, in the light. And then it, as if the earth were flat, it drips off into empty space. And in the dream, I sit in what feels like emptiness for a very long time. And then poof, there's this transformation where I see this beautiful geometric grid made of light around earth, but the composition of the light is actually people. And they look like millions of skydivers. Have you seen skydivers when they jump off a plane in a group and they're connected to each other by holding each other's wrists and ankles? That's what I see is this giant grid. And I'm both individual and collective. So there's the me that's a part of that grid uh, that's still separate, but there's also we. I'm also connected to that grid in this giant mass of consciousness and we're trying to help people on earth. It's almost like we're a collective consciousness and people on earth would ask questions and we would try to answer the questions. It was kind of bizarre. I was both individual and collective. And it just, I just realized that's what death is. It's, you know, there's this constant dance between me and we, but there's never any death. There's just transformation. Mm-hmm. And it was over after that. I have other things that trip me up, but death is not one of them anymore. And that all came through dreams. And it also taught me the value of embracing and facing fears and that dreams can help you through that. That is so true. This doesn't have to do necessarily with the dreams, but you do spend time in, in the book talking about this experience you had when any energy entered your life. So talk to me about what that was like. Well, that was the most exciting and enthralling time of my life by a long shot, also most unexpected. I didn't even know what the word meant and didn't even know what it implied. And so I had to look it up and I was like, yeah, that is what's happening to me. That was also a continuation of what I would describe this integration of my feminine side. And I don't think it's true for everybody, but for a lot of people, the Kundalini journey is a journey into all things feminine, sometimes called sexual energy, earth energy, primal energy. And it's very powerful. The dreams I had were over the top. The visions I had were over the top. The energy was both unbelievably orgasmic, honey-like, beautiful, blissful, and it's sometimes harrowing. There were times that the energy felt like literally like heart paddles, like if I died and had a heart attack, they're trying to shock the heart back into life and I would wake up sweating. But it also was a continuation of, you know, I I talked to some people, Lawrence Edwards has probably written one of the best books on it. And he said, ultimate Kundalini is about union with the divine. And I spoke to another author who said, you have to understand Kundalini is really just balancing energy. If you've been very one-sided, Kundalini is not only going to sort of heal and purify a lot of things that have been tripping you up, it's going to bring balance to your life. And I had been entirely one-sided. I just didn't know it. I'll give you a couple of dream experiences, really short. So if you remember in the book, I was a single dad. This was the fun thing, was trying to balance all this while I'm running a company and have custody of my two little kids. I would sometimes come home from work early and try and get a little cat nap in before the kids would ring the doorbell and the school bus had dropped them off. And one after late afternoon, I went in, I, I would fall asleep in like 10 seconds and instantly be in a dream. And in the dream, I would be, I'm being held in the arms, spoon bit from behind by this luscious, sexy goddess. 
and she had her long slender arms wrapped around me and long fingers and she's adjusting adjusting a radio dial in my belly and she's searching for a very subtle station but when she finds it my whole body erupts in bliss and then we lose the station again and she adjusts it again and then oh, here comes the bliss again and then the doorbell rings and my kids are home <laughs> And like the next day, same thing. I fall asleep in an instant and there's a goddess, beautiful, sitting on my tailbone. I'm completely paralyzed and she's blowing a powerful wind through my whole body, like so powerful in the dream. I can see every hair on my body, my arms and legs flapping in the wind as this wind is blowing out all of the pores. That was that was a little terrifying because of the paralysis part. But again, it kind of speaks to part of the kundalini process is a kind of cleansing, purifying process. She was trying to blow everything out. And then the doorbell rings and my kids are home. <laughs> oh, can you recreate this experience? Can I recreate it? Yeah. Meaning go back into the dream? No, the kundalini experience. Oh, can I recreate it now? Yes. Oh, it was entirely spontaneous. It did everything on its own. I was one of those ones that had a spontaneous awakening. I wasn't doing yoga or kundalini processes of any time. And that, the funny thing was I would wake up sometimes in strange yoga positions and I didn't do yoga, but it was entirely consistent with kundalini. Um, again, a lot of sexual energy, a lot of goddess energy, feminine like crazy, tons of serpents. Good thing I wasn't afraid of snakes, giant cobras. And yeah, it was, I, I, it's hard to, it's hard to encapsulate in one interview. I feel like I could go on for hours talking about that. I'm sure. So tell me this, what do you think your life would be like if you hadn't discovered your dreams? Somebody used the term thirsty. I think I would be thirsting for something, but not know what it was. And so dreams add an element of thirst quenching, an element of magic, an element of the miraculous. It's added an element of trust and faith because the dreams are entirely supportive. Even when they're difficult, I realize on some level they're actually supportive. And so maybe without all of that, I think I would be a curmudgeonly old man, <laughs> stuck in old habits. I would be thirsty and probably feel like I'd be more in a state of anxiety and fear more of the time rather than trust and faith. Well, John, how can people find out more about you and your book? Yeah, uh, website is John David Latta. It's L-A-T-T-A. JohnDavidLatta.com is my website. And my book is The Synchronicity of Love, Stories That Heal, Transform, and Awaken. I chose the title because... I discovered the more I stay with what feels like the heart center and unconditional love, the more miraculous synchronicity starts to unfold in my life. And that's what I was trying to explore. Wonderful. Well, John, thank you so much for being on Dream Power Radio today. Thank you for the invitation, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Well, we've been speaking with author and dreamer, John David Lada. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. If so, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector Weissman saying, Sweet dreams, everybody. You've been listening to Dream Power Radio with your host, Debbie Spector Weissman. For more information on Debbie or to sign up for her newsletter, go to dreampowerradio.com. This has been Dream Power Radio on the amazing Women and Men of Power Network, the world's leading positive programming network, powered by Raven International.